Walking out the out uh, of uh, the university, going down to Rue Saint Michel and Rue de Coles, uh, there's several libraries, and I find this this book later, not not in that time, but one day when I was with a family, I find this book, which is the Atlas, the Atlas of uh, castles and forts of France. You can see it. Look. And you can see how big it is. Evidently, it was not new. Uh, I even have it with plastic and everything. Walking out the out uh, of uh, the university, going down to Rue Saint Michel and Rue de Coles, uh, there's several libraries, and I find this this book later, not not in that time, but one day when I was with a family, I find this book, which is the Atlas, the Atlas of uh, castles and forts of France. You can see it, look. And you can see how big it is. Evidently it was not new. Uh, I even have it with plastic and everything. Because it's a jewel for me, because I realize that really we have been living in community for so many, many years. And uh, to live in a condominium today in a complex, uh, uh, in a condominium, <coughs> literally is to live in community. When you see that there is Rupestric paintings uh, 40,000 years ago, you can understand that uh, if there is a, a human that like to paint in their caves, in their walls, uh, deer, or they like to paint horses, or they like to paint bulls, or they like to paint uh, wild animals. That means that it was a person that loved the aesthetics, that loved the art, that loved uh, colors. And, uh, and evidently, yes, they were primitive, but I think uh, they were trying to live in a charming place, in a nice place that we, they could habitate uh, comfortably. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be uh, will, wouldn't be fixing it like, like that. So that's why I think uh, uh, we the humans uh, always uh, for many thousands of thousands of years we try to help each other. At first we live in clans. Uh, at first we were complete, contemplative because there were so many things in earth like fruit and uh, nuts and uh, food that we just could go and get the things and eat but later we uh, start to collect and walk for the things and to hunt. And, uh, and uh, when I find this book of the castles and forts of France, which is, there is hundreds, if not thousands of castles, I realize that we have been living in community for so many, many years because these are medieval time castles from the 1300s for the, from the uh, year uh, 1000 uh, uh, after Christ and uh, if you look through the story of the world, through the story of the humanity, really I start to study the life in a community and there is history in, in Babylonia which is uh, Iraq today, uh, there is history of uh, of uh, uh, common property and, uh, in, uh, in Rome, in the three eras, in the, uh, in the monarchy, in the republic, and, the, and the, in the empire at the end, and also in the law empire and, and in the Byzantine empire. Uh, truly, uh, the human beings only have been owners of private property in two seasons of the humanity, which are the Roman season in their three uh, most important eras, like I said, the monarchy, the republic, and the, and the empire, and uh, the law empire and the, and the Byzantine empire that ended in the year 1000, more or less, in the sacro uh, 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 Roman Germanic empire. And, uh, and uh, so that's why uh, we were owners directly having private property uh, in the Roman times and also 
than uh, until after the French Revolution. Only in my opinion, they, we were the, they, those were the only times in which there was private property. Because really, in the era of the uh, Egyptians, there was no private property. There was only property for the pharaoh, uh, for the monarchy. Uh, the priests were privileged too, like, like always in history. Even with the Aztecs, there was only uh, the monarchy, uh, the royalty, the priest, and, uh, and, and the populum, the, the, the populum, the, the workers and the people that really uh, are part of the, there was no citizens. Uh, only in Rome, yes, in Rome, uh, it, they were privileged, with, they were full of rights. Uh, since those days, all the cities were fortress. Uh, you can see it, the Paris, the, the Paris tribe that arrived in Paris uh, before the, the, the Gallo-Roman Gallo -Roman invasion, uh, they set up uh, their, uh, their uh, fortress in the, island, uh, in the island of the city, the Ile de la Cité in, uh, in Paris, in the almost uh, 20 acre, that a long island. And uh, there were several uh, fortresses of the city. Later, the city of Paris had uh, another fortress of uh, 400 acres, of 200 hectares. And they, uh, they had, I put it in my book because it's very interesting. Uh, uh, there, was, there was more, uh, there was more uh, 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 surrounding uh, fortress. Uh, Charles V in the uh, 14th century uh, also uh, uh, made works for another fortress of the city and also in 1785 uh, and, 18, and 1840 uh, the King Louis Philippe uh, made uh, what today is called the Périphérique which is the, the highway that surrounds the city of Paris. And you can see that wall until today, and that wall uh, was made by Louis Philippe. So the farmers, when they exit the city, will pay their taxes. But uh, in a way, there were so many cities that were fortresses, because normally there was uh, little towns of 20, 25 homes, 40 homes, surrounded by uh, big, big walls. And if there was a pandemic, or if there was a, a war, they just simply closed the door, and they used to have grains, they used to have food, they used to have normally a well, and, uh, and uh, provisions to last months and months until the pandemic or the wars pass. I have in my, in my book uh, several interesting pictures that I can show you. Uh, that how people used to live in, in community. And the, the, the reason I talk about this and the history is because to live today in a condominium complex, in a condominium uh, complex, is really to live in a, in a community like they used to live for so many and so many years. And for example, I have this picture of this castle that has 600 years. Uh, which is uh, near Paris too, near Paris. Look, this castle from the floor to the top it has 10 floors and then uh, there is this uh, other uh, house and, and then there is another town that uh, you can see how uh, uh, the city of Torat, that I also put in my book, is just uh, like 12 homes, 12 homes surrounded by a wall, and in the center you can see perhaps there is a church today or a well, and uh, and uh, and uh, they can uh, be protected. They were protected since those days.
So my, uh, that's why I was so interested to, to talk about uh, the community, the, co the community life because it's, not, it's nothing new. It's nothing new, it's something that it has happened for so many and many years. Uh, you can find cities surrounded by walls like Toledo in Spain. You can see cities if you take the route from Paris to Geneva, you find Grenoble. Grenoble is another uh, city that is walled, walled and, uh, uh, with fortress. And, uh, and uh, in, in this book, as I told you, there is thousands, thousands of, of castles, thousands of castles. Uh, uh, that uh, that prove that the human civilization had, has had been living has been living in community for so many years, and uh, I want to chat to you very casually, very casual, because you understand uh, my English is not my first language. My first language is is uh, Spanish but I'm trying to teach you about the bylaws, the rules and regulations of the condominium system in Mexico. And to understand that, uh, you need to understand that we live practically in two different worlds. The Anglo-Saxon world is completely different from the Latin uh, law system. The Latin law system mainly rules in Italy, rules in North uh, of Italy in Germany and uh, rules in France, in Spain, in Portugal, in Mexico and South America. And you will ask me why Germany uh, is not Latin and why they have the same system of, uh, of law, the, the law, the notarial law system, uh, which is Latin, because um, uh, the Visigoths and the Germanic people, uh, they conquer Rome at the end and uh, in, uh, after the Byzantine uh, uh, Empire, uh, little by little they, will end in, uh, they were having control under the Romans and uh, that's, why, uh, that's why Charles, Charles the, the V, who, who also was Charles I in Spain, uh, he was the descendant of the uh, Sacro Roman Empire because truly he was an Habsburg, Habsburg uh, an Archduke. And uh, it's funny because Charles V not only ruled in the south part of Italy, the north part of Italy, the Germanic part, but also he ruled in the Netherlands. He was born in Flans and uh, in Brussels, and uh, and he speak he spoke uh, he spoke Flemish. Uh, it's really funny that he was the king of Spain and the king of uh, he had uh, the, the, he conquered the new Spain, Mexico, but in Peru and uh, most of the part of South America. But truly, uh, he w he used to speak Flemish, and he kn he knew French and he knew other languages, but di with difficult he, he spoke in, uh, in, in Spanish. And uh, he, he died in, 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 in Spain uh, in those days where they were uh, kingdoms, uh, Castilla and, and other kingdoms, but uh, he died in Spain and his son Philip, Philip II, uh, he uh, really spoke very good Spanish and he was, uh, I would say, pacifist king, and uh, he lived in the same era of Elizabeth I, uh, Philip II. Even he tried to to get married with uh, Elizabeth I, but at the end uh, it did not work because he had the opportunity to marry the daughter of the King of France, uh, I think uh, Elizabeth Valois, and uh, and. Uh, and he had four marriages, uh, and uh, he was a pacifist, but nevertheless he was forced to fight with Elizabeth I, and he lost the Netherlands, and he lost uh, that part, not because the war, 
but because the Calvinist and the Lutheran uh, movement, because he really was the point of the arrow of the Catholicism. And uh, Felipe II, in those days, remember they have since uh, Charles the First, uh, Charles the Fifth, and uh, and uh, and Charles the First, which was the same person, Charles the First of Spain. They have the War of the Hundred Years, and they have they have the uh, the War of the Religions. So in reality, uh, uh, Philip the Second loses. Uh, uh, the Netherlands and the, and the Flemish world because uh, the thoughts of the Calvinists and the Lutherans against the Catholics and uh, and he really decided to control the rest of his kingdom which in those days I'm talking in the 16th, 17th and 18th century really the kingdom of Spain was the most important kingdom of the world that's why uh, when you come to Mexico City, they used to call Mexico City the, the city of the palaces because there were so many palaces and there was some, so much wealth because Mexico produced, even today we still have the first, uh, 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 the first place in, in silver and for many years we have been producing um, minerals but part of the wealth of, uh, of Spain, in reality, was uh, the wealth of Mexico. In those days, uh, it was easy for Philip II also to, to, to be very close with Portugal, because since his father, his father married uh, the daughter of the King of Portugal, Elizabeth, uh, Charles V, and who was also Charles I of Spain, so he was having a good relation with, uh, with Portugal. So it was really an enormous monarchy, an enormous kingdom, the kingdom uh, uh, of, of, of Spain. So in that regard, we follow the law and the Latin system, which in reality is, are the Roman laws. And the Roman laws uh, were written in codes, in, uh, in códigos, in codes, in books, because the emperors uh, uh, decide that the people knew the laws, that they could read the the uh, the, the laws in books, and uh, a difference to the uh, common law uh, from uh, the Commonwealth and from uh, England. Uh, is a system completely different, which is based in uh, today is based in a jurisdiction uh, a system, which is uh, uh, a jurisprudence uh, system, which is based on, on the sentences of any case of any uh, the court cases. They have a sentence, and if that sentence is repeated in the same way. Uh, it creates, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a background and it creates uh, a norm, and uh, and that's why uh, when you go to when you lose a case in the United States and you appeal, it's very complicated because uh, uh, they have to uh, analyze so many resolutions that historically they ha they they have. We do have that uh, jurisprudence system in Mexico, but only we have it in the high tribunal, which is the last tribunal, the Supreme Court. And uh, normally, the jurisprudence system that we have in the highest court is taking place in uh, in a group, in uh, in uh, in a, a group of judges. Uh, someone presents. Uh, uh, what we call ponencia, and if the different uh, ministers of the court decide that is correct, uh, the proposal uh, of that sentence, uh, or, uh, they approve it, and uh, and it, it causes jurisprudence. And the difference between Mexico and United States is that uh, uh, the jurisprudence system. Uh, is based uh, since the first instance 
in the courts and, uh, and normally the case had to be related to an old uh, uh, resolution that could be similar. Uh, so uh, it's quite, quite different, completely different, but it's a system that has worked for many years in, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, in the Commonwealth and in the United States. That does not mean that there is no laws. Yes, United States has laws, but th those are laws uh, produced by the Congress uh, and also by the local Congress, the state Congresses of the different states of the United States. And, and also they have resolutions in the cities uh, which are uh, different bylaws uh, to regulate the municipal, the municipal things. But you do not have, like we do, codes. Uh, we belong to, uh, to the civil uh, code of Napoleonic. Uh, we inherit in Mexico the civil code of Napoleonic, which at the same time it was inherited by Napoleon from the Romans for so many years. And remember that the Romans were really uh, an incredible civilization that was uh, born uh, 500 years before Christ. Uh, and since those days also, if I don't remember, but uh, the, Roman, the Roman city had also a wall named the, the, the Salvia Wall and uh, that surrounded the city uh, since the empire, since the monarchy. And, uh, and uh, most of the cities <clears throat> those days had walls because they, they were needed to be protected. But one, I, it's, this is very important to tell you this so you understand why we live in different worlds. You have a different system that comes from the Commonwealth. Uh, <clears throat> your system, even re religiously, uh, uh, we, we call each other Christians, but in reality the main uh, 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 religion that was bring to United States was the Anglican religion, but also with a heavy influence of the Lutherans and the Calvinists. So, uh, 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 what they call the Protestants. And we in Mexico, as I told you, Philip II was the point of the arrow of the Catholicism. And he was, in those days, Europe was divided into <clears throat> two big groups. Uh, the, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, and the Huguenots in, in France, and, uh, and the, uh, the Catholics, which were represented by uh, Philip II. So that's why we are so different. Uh, in Mexico, always the Catholic priests have a special uh, treat for them and not even uh, in the colony, also in the pre-colony. There was not private property in the pre-colony with the Aztecs or with the different tribes. They used to paint uh, the land with colors. Uh, there was a color for the monarchy, there was a color for the royalty, there was colors for the, uh, for the commoners, and, uh, and uh, and we did have only commun communal land. As I told you, the only times that the civilization, the human civilization has had private property is only in the Roman, uh, in the Roman times and after the French Revolution. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what I want to explain to you in Mexico is also what is the position of the notary. The notary in the United States is different from the notary in Mexico because in Mexico we are we are lawyers and we are uh, I would say we are special people uh, that uh, uh, we had study uh, private law mainly we are expert in contracts and uh, uh, private law normally is the deals that have to do with uh, the affairs of the business, the business between uh, between persons, and uh, in Mexico, the notary 
uh, is, is the one who makes the transfer of, of properties, is the one who collects the taxes for the transfer of property, for the public record office fees, for the capital gain taxes. So in reality we are collector of taxes uh, when uh, there is a transaction or a transmission of property. But it's quite uh, an obligation because if we fail to calculate the amounts correctly, we are liable and we need to pay with our own uh, state or with our own money. In the United States, uh, it used to be a very important figure, the notary. Even I have this book uh, from this author from the United States. His name is uh, uh, Raymond, Raymond Rotman. Raymond C. Rotman. I have it a long time ago. And uh, uh, he, he shows something very interesting. He shows one of the first appointments of a notary in, notary in the United States from 1878 from a notary for the District of Columbia. And, uh, and is an appointment from, a, from one of the presidents of the United States. And uh, this is a quite interested, interesting book because he describes how is the practice uh, of, of, of the notaries in the United States. And in the 18th and 19th century, indeed, uh, they used to handle transmissions of properties uh, the notaries, but soon uh, they decide that it was a matter of the states, and really the states, uh, uh, at one point, they decide to do what they call commissioners of deeds. Uh, they appoint commissioners of deeds, and the world is quite descriptive. Uh, there are com it was a commissioner to produce deeds of homes or, or, or real estate. So, but it says that uh, this figure uh, was uh, surpassed, I would say, by the private uh, lawyers that there were so many and they wanted to, to practice, uh, and they were expert in private law, that uh, at the end the notaries were superated by the just the regular practic practice of the lawyer. And today, because most of the contracts are done by the lawyers and by the title company. In Mexico, we the notaries are the title company, but also we are lawyers. To become a notary, you need to make an exam of notarial law. You need to be become first a lawyer, then to uh, specialize in notarial law. And then you have an exam of opposition. And according to the old law of uh, notarial law, for every 50,000 people, there's one notary. In my case, in Acapulco, Mexico, where I have my practice, we are 19 notaries. And in Acapulco, we are almost 2 million people. Not 2 million, but almost 2 million. So we are exactly really, uh, 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 for every 50,000, we are one notary. We have fulfilled the law, the local notarial law. So. Uh, that's one of the articles of the of the of the old law, but I, I recommend you this book for any notary in the United States. Uh, look for it. It's it's old Raymond C. Rotman. And uh, I needed to explain that because sometimes when the foreign uh, comes to Mexico and they see that there is certain restrictions for them to buy in the coast and to buy in the borders. Normally the foreign, they, they buy in the coast, they want to go to the beach. In Acapulco we have hundreds of buildings of uh, condominium complexes and uh, we have buildings of 600 condominiums or 400 or 300. So it's quite complex the, the, the condominium industry in, in Acapulco and in also in Cancun and uh, Cozumel and all those places. But the foreigners, they find out that they have restrictions to buy and they need to buy through a trust. <clears throat> and yes, the trust is exactly the same as the trust in the United States. The only difference is that in Mexico, 
the trust, uh, the settler is normally the, the company that is going to sell you the unit or the seller. Uh, the fiduciary, it has to be by law a bank, a Mexican bank. And uh, the beneficiary, it will be uh, the, the person who is going to purchase, in this case, the foreigner. So, um, but you are free to buy inside of Mexico. If you want to buy, for example, in San Miguel de Allende, or you want to buy in Guadalajara, or in Ajiji, in Chapala, uh, you can buy without a trust. The restriction is only for the for the beach and for the borders, and for the beach it has to be from the limit of the federal zone that we call in the ocean, 50 kilometers deep, and in the border is 100 kilometers inside the border. So, out of that, you have no restriction as an investment to buy in uh, in, uh, in in all Mexico. I need to explain you why uh, these restrictions were born. Mexico, through the history, uh, through the sto through the history, we have been victims of uh, different interventions of foreign countries. Uh, the main intervention that provoked these restrictions was the uh, intervention, the French intervention, that happened in 1838, in 1839, that we call the War of the Cakes. And it happened because there was a bakery, uh, a chef uh, or baker in Mexico City in the area of Tacubaya. And there was like a riot and uh, some soldiers from General Santana uh, came to come down the riot. But uh, at the end, uh, they got into the, uh, everybody got in into the bakery, they stole the cakes, they destroyed the bakery. So really the baker, which was a, was a French gentleman, asked for a payment, if my memory does not betray me, it was about 3,000 pesos what he demanded from the Mexican government. Because these were soldiers of the General Santana. He already uh, uh, was a former uh, he combat already in the Alamo. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but he was a very famous general that later became several times, 11 times president because Mexico in those times was full of uh, ups and downs that is difficult to explain, but I will explain one day. So it took two years to settle the matter and Louis Philippe, the same king that made the, the last uh, wall of, of uh, Paris that today is the peripheric, the periferica uh, or the highway that goes around the, the city. Uh, Louis Philippe had a son that he wanted to promote to be his successor. And he sent his son with 20 ships of war to Mexico and he invaded Mexico to Veracruz. And yes, indeed, the flag uh, flew in, uh, in, uh, in Veracruz and uh, the, negotiation, the negotiations took two years and at the end, the bill that originally was 3,000 pesos, it became to 600,000 pesos, which was a lot of money in those days. Because in those days, we used to have uh, uh, the gold, you know, we, there were gold coins and silver coins. So, so uh, that was the first intervention, but it was really what target the restrictions, and today, if you are going to do a corporate participate in a Mexican corporation or you are going to buy a piece of land in Mexico in the contract we need to include that you renounce to the protection of your country and you declare yourself a Mexican for uh, you declare yourself as a Mexican for any affairs of disputes that you could have in that affair in that business so we call it that the clause of the inclusion of foreign uh, participants. And uh, then we have the second French intervention in 1865 with Maximilian, the Archduke Maximilian from the... Uh, it was also promoted by, by Napoleon III 
because the United States had in those days his, their civil war and Napoleon III thought that he could have a monarchy uh, with tendencies, with French tendencies or a monarchy in a way controlled by, by the French and they look for a, a, a royal which in that time was uh, Maximilian of Augsburg, Habsburg, who was the brother of Francis Joseph, the, the monarch of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he came to Mexico and ruled Mexico from 1965 to 19, 19, uh, 1865 to 1867. And that was the second intervention. And even the last intervention that we have, we have in the middle uh, of the 1840s also another intervention from the United States, and they flew the, the American flag in the National Palace and even in the castles of Chapultepec. And, uh, and uh, even uh, there was riots, and uh, there was uh, the St. Patrick's uh, Regiment, uh, there were these uh, Irish that uh, uh, re reveal against the Americans and they form a battalion and they die in Mexico. There were like, I think, 20 something Irish that fought in the Mexican side. But the last intervention was in 1914 from United States of America and they uh, invade Veracruz and the flu of United Sta the, the flag of United States uh, flew also in in, in Veracruz. So those are the reasons, the different interventions. I narrate to you already four interventions uh, uh, are the reason why Mexico is very cautious about the foreign investment. So in any deal that you make, in any corporation that you form as a foreigner, in any transaction, in any transfer of property that you do, uh, you have to uh, in the in the contracts with the notaries, we put that clause of uh, of uh, renouncing that you as a foreigner renounce to the protection of your country in the event of any dispute uh, in that affair in that kind of business that you're doing. So that's the reason uh, why we need to set up a trust. Uh, as you know, trust uh, comes. From, it's a very old figure that was born in the, in the 17th, 18th century, in the 17th century since the English Revolution with the lords. The lords who were ha having all kinds of tenants of land, uh, they, had, uh, they used to rent land in England. Uh, they, uh, you, they loved to travel, like Darwin, like also von Humboldt, he was German, but he was also a lord. Uh, they used to love to travel, to investigate, and uh, they have a person in which they trust that they used to administrate uh, their state, and they, uh, that person used to send uh, the lord monies to Italy, to India, to Azores, everywhere that they were, uh, so they could have a uh, a good life or an, a life of investigation of, uh, of, uh, of art and, uh, and uh, of, of good uh, life. So if you see the translation trust comes from, uh, from uh, what we call uh, confident, confiar, and uh, in the difference is that in the Anglo-Saxon, in the Commonwealth, in the British and Anglo law, uh, uh, the fiduciary can be a person. In Mexico, that cannot be. Only the fiduciary can be a bankary institution, a bank, and, uh, and no person can be a beneficiary, a, a fiduciary. Uh, the beneficiary is going to be yourself as a foreign investor that are going to come to Mexico. So, uh, mainly, uh, that's one of the points that I want to explain to you. I want to explain to you why the restrictions. I want to explain to you 
how different we are, how different are the laws that we have in the Anglo world and in the Spanish world. In the Anglo world, I told you, you have a system based in a resolution of jurisprudence, and in Mexico we have a system, uh, those resolutions are linked to the cases, and, uh, and in Mexico we have uh, a system that is based in uh, civil codes, uh, written civil codes, that uh, they have uh, the background of the Romans and then the Napoleonic Code, and all the laws from Spain were transported to Mexico uh, or to the new Spain like in uh, one of those magic carpets. So we were exactly the same laws that had in Spain are the same laws that we have before uh, 1810 in, 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 the in the colony. Now I would like to talk to you about the what is the property. I want to talk to you by to talk to you about property, about co-ownership, and about the condominium treatment. I want to talk to you about this because in there's two kinds of properties. is the direct property and the co-ownership. And with the combination of these two, the third uh, uh, kind of property, uh, which is the condominium regimen, is born. Uh, because in the condominium regimen, you are owner of your unit at 100%. You are a direct owner of your unit. And you are a co-owner of the common areas of the of the condominium complex. So it's very interesting how, uh, as I said, there's two kinds of uh, property: the the property by itself, uh, the direct property, and the co-ownership is according to Marcel Planiol and George Rupert, which are two French authors that we follow in the Mexican law, uh, is uh, the co-ownership is considered in Mexico uh, all that property that is owned by two or more people. Uh, let's say, and Planiol in Repair describe uh, the definition of this in a numeric number. Uh, they said that when uh, two or more people are the owners of a lot or of a building or a property, um, the, the, the co-ownership is born. And it's born in, in, uh, in half, in a third, in a fourth, in a fifth, in a sixth, in a seventh, uh, in a tenth uh, part. So, and uh, for example, assuming that we have a building in a condominium that has ten floors, you're going to be uh, a direct owner of your unit and you are going to have a co-ownership in 10% of the common areas. That's why I said, and I want to explain to you, that the condominium is a combination of the private property and the co-ownership. And the co-ownership, it will be in relation to the proportion that you share with the other co-owners. So, if it's a building of uh, uh, three units, evidently you are owner at 100% of your unit, but you're going to be owner in a third percent, in a third percent, yes, in 33% of the uh, common uh, uh, property, which is going to be the common property is going to be the swimming pool, the stairs, the the uh, the elevator, and there's also parts that you don't see, and but you own, like the ceiling, uh, half of the walls, uh, the drainage, uh, the inside tubing. Uh, uh, you are going to be you're going to have a part of co-ownership of those uh, of those uh, materials. <coughs> it's funny because. It's quite complicated because today in Mexico we have uh, condominiums that are towers. We have condominiums that we have called that we call mix that are towers and villas or homes or townhouses. 
we have townhouses, we have uh, our little homes or apartments. Uh, we had also, uh, we use this figure uh, for different things. We use the condominium for markets. For example, there is uh, markets where they sell uh, merchandise, Mexican merchandise. Uh, and there is markets that, that they have like uh, 20 square foot uh, and they make them in condominium. Also the malls in Mexico, the malls in Mexico normally they sell them, they don't rent them. In Mexico normally a big company comes and uh, they, make, they make a big mall, they create a condominium regimen and then they sell it to Sears or to dealers or to Liverpool or to Palacio de Hierro or to Abercrombie. So in Mexico normally those are condominium regimens and also in Mexico we have uh, condominium regiments in industrial parks. The industrial parks, you know Mexico for example in Veracruz there is 15 uh, industrial parks and every industrial park are enormous. They, are, they have three or four thousand acres or more and, uh, and every lot could be of 200 acres or, or 400 acres and in that area there is going to be a lot that is going to be in condominium and the common areas are going to be the streets or the, the weight for the trailers, uh, some parking for the community of trailers and also in Mexico uh, they make condominiums for subdivisions probably you have that in United States. I have seen in United States that uh, they have airstrips and around the airstrip they have different uh, small houses that they could be independent lots or they could make condominiums. In Mexico this figure is so uh, uh, popular that in Mexico City there is many uh, towers in golf courses there is condominiums that they have their own uh, horse stables for uh, equestrians uh, <clears throat> and there's many modalities of condominiums uh, in Mexico uh, 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 to be honest with you uh, you can buy in Mexico uh, in project in a project of condominium the law allows uh, for the developer to make a project. You will find some little flags and announcement, and uh, they will tell you that they will sell to you uh, an apartment 20% uh, cheaper, but it's going to be in two or three years. And uh, the Mexican law, the Mexican law permits to create a. a a regimen, we call it regimen of condominium uh, uh, in project. I want to talk to you about the different kind of contracts in Mexico. In Mexico we have unilateral contracts, we have multilateral, we have uh, bilateral contracts which is a, 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 a sale of, a, of two people, of two wheels, and uh, trilateral contracts which for example is a trust in which is the settler that's selling the bank that is the fiduciary and the foreigner that is going to be the beneficiary and also we have uh, multilateral multilateral contracts in which uh, many people participate it can participate five people for example what we call the guarantee trust in which two banks uh, participate and the first banks uh, give uh, the rights of the beneficiary, uh, they put them in trust uh, in the other bank uh, to, to guarantee certain obligations. So uh, the condominium regimen is a unilateral contract. Uh, the unilateral obligations, the tradition in the Latin uh, law they did not agree uh, very much. Uh, they only agreed that there was obligations of two person and more. But very uh, rare uh, is recently that they 
accept that there was unilateral obligations. A unilateral obligations, for example, is a will. A will, when you make your testament, uh, uh, that's a unilateral obligation. That uh, it produces an effect uh, per, uh, per mortis causa after you die, and uh, and another unilateral uh, declaration is to constitute or to create a, a, a regimen of condominium. So, so uh, what this means is that you are auto obligating yourself to create a building, to make a building, to create ten units to transfer in a private property to each person their private unit and the common areas in a 10 percent proportion uh, to, uh, to the buyers. So in reality the uh, regimen in condominium as we see it in Mexico is a declaration of a unilateral uh, uh, will and, uh, and uh, which auto-obligates the person or auto-obligates the company to create that new juridic situation for that lot, for that building. Because in order to make a condominium, a, cond a condominium complex, a condo complex, a condominium complex, you need to be an owner. You cannot uh, uh, create a condominium if you are not an owner. Uh, it can be created by a corporation that owns a piece of land or a building or it can be created by a physical person a person that creates and makes a building and, and, and makes a sale or promotes the sale. I want to tell you that in Mexico uh, the person and the corporations have exactly the same attributes what are the same attributes? The same attributes are that they have a domicile. Uh, the person, uh, physic person, has a domicile. The corporation, which could be the civil association of uh, condo owners, has a domicile, which is going to be in the building of that uh, complex. Uh, the, the person has uh, uh, a date of birth, and the civil association of uh, co-owners also has a date of birth uh, which is going to be when it was set up uh, with the notary. The notary is the one who makes uh, the corporations in Mexico uh, uh, and also the associations. And in that regard I want to tell you that the corporations, we in Mexico do not have the one-man company. Uh, we only have companies or corporations for more than two people, two and more people. And, uh, and uh, the civil association uh, is not a company because it does not have shares. The corporations, like companies, they have shares, they have a value, and uh, they, they worth the mon money. And, uh, and the civil association, the participants will I, which are associated, for example, in a civil association of condo owners, they only have a right of participation, but they do not have shares. They have the rights to participate in an assembly and act accordingly to their uh, proposals and to the approvals that they can uh, uh, do in the, in the assembly of the condo owners. So uh, I wanted to talk about the attributes because of, uh, in Mexico, uh, you are capable to have full rights uh, when you are born, but also uh, you, have, you are capable to have uh, capacity uh, rights after you are 18 years old. But also you can lose your capacity. You can lose your capacity when, <coughs> when, <coughs> when you lose your mind, when you have Alzheimer's, when you die, if you, uh, we said in Mexican law that the, the capacity is extinguished because you already died, you do not exist. So 
uh, it's very important to understand that because also the civil association of condo of condo owners it can be extinguished uh, uh, like you as a person that you die also the civil association of condo owners can be extinguished if the building for example is too old and they're going to demolish it there is no point to have the association anymore so it, it uh, disappeared so uh, it's raining hard it's raining hard and we have lightning but I hope it doesn't disturb the the this chat so in, uh, in Europe in floors in uh, in uh, in uh, in a, con in a condominium uh, or in communal property, uh, common property, is very, very old. Uh, 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 there is, uh, for example, they brought the architecture to Mexico by uh, El Virrey de Mendoza, who established himself in Mexico in 1535 in Pátzcuaro, Michoacán and you can see the main plaza the main plaza are just buildings to the style of spain of the plaza mayor the main uh, square of uh, madrid the plaza mayor and they're just they're just like apartments so so really the, the life in, in in europe is very very old and it's really from the roman times and uh, in the roman too they have uh, uh, backwards of uh, there is a history that they used to have also uh, a life in uh, in in common and uh, in El Digesto Romano uh, there is uh, uh, they it shows that there was two houses with the same ceiling but they were record in the public record office as a, each unit as a different house so there was. Uh, the the uh, the common property in a condominium like uh, we have was not like that but i'm sure they used to collaborate in the expenses like we do to, we do today the corporations to the difference of the associations uh they have rights because they have shareholders and the shares they have a price uh, the companies normally uh they owned uh, property and, uh, and each share has a value, has a, it has a, an amount uh, of cost of the, of the share. But a difference from the associations of, uh, of, uh, of condo owners, uh, you have only rights of participations in the assembly. So uh, in reality, there's, we call them uh, uh, Kells and the German uh, uh, Jewish uh, 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 jurist, uh, jurist uh, uh, he called them collective uh, entities uh, to the corporations. And the association is also a collective entity, but to the difference of the corporations, uh, the associations do not have shares and the corporations they do have chairs uh, in the associations we can put uh, also uh, uh, the a foundation for example for for normally we call them the associations are non-lucrative and the corporations the companies are lucrative so in our mexican law that's the big difference one is uh, set up mainly to make a business, which is the corporation, the, the, we call them Sociedades Anonymas, and, uh, and they have to be formed by two people and, and more shareholders. And the associations, in the case of the civil association of a condo uh, a complex, condominium complex, uh, they only have rights of participation. So, uh, uh, in Mexico, uh, once you buy your your unit, uh, when you purchase uh, your unit in the transaction, in the deed that you're going to get, uh, attach is uh, the by uh, by laws and rules and regulations of that uh, condominium complex. 
So uh, that obligates you in the future to pay your maintenance fee and you cannot uh, have any excuse to delinquent uh, that payment that normally in the condominiums in Mexico sometimes is monthly payment or sometimes they have it uh, in a bimester every two months some condominiums they have it every three months some every six and only in, not in condominiums but in uh, I would say in subdivisions uh, that are private they have a yearly fee uh, of maintenance uh, like you have in the United States mainly uh, those are the points that I want to talk to you in once you buy a unit uh, we have in Mexico what we call a personal right or the royal rights a personal right is only the uh, right that you have to possess to enjoy but you don't have the right to uh, sell the uh, sell or to or to uh, transfer that uh, good or to mortgage that good uh, we call that royal rights in Mexico when you have a royal right for your uh, unit of condominium uh, you have full rights of your unit but you do not have full rights of the common areas uh, uh, we call it uh, those common areas are limited because suddenly if you wish you cannot just go to the common areas and uh, and make yourself a little casita or put an umbrella or put a tent uh, I mean a, a fixed tent uh, or make a construction because you like to do that you cannot do that that has to be approved by the assembly so uh, uh, you have royal rights uh, in your unit but uh, also in part you have royal rights share uh, in the common areas in the Spanish uh, law they call it uh, uh, that is a limited uh, right in the common areas and, and they are right it's really a limited right they call it uh, a poor a poor right like if you don't have money a poor right they call it in, in the Spanish uh, from Spain uh, uh, condominium uh, law anyway I think uh, uh, I want you to understand in this program in this chat uh, that uh, once you are owner of a condo unit you are going to participate in a civil association of co-owners of condo owners and in that civil association there is a, a president of the association there is a treasurer of the association there is a secretary of the association and under, under them if it's a big building a big a condominium complex there is an administrator and also we have what we call in Mexico the vigilance committee the vigilance committee I call it is the police of the condominium uh, it uh, is checking the president, is checking the, the administrator, it supervises the works, it follows uh, the orders of the assembly and uh, follows up uh, uh, what all the affairs that are approved in the assembly. So it's quite interesting. Nevertheless, uh, they are the ones that sign the contracts, the vigilance committee, uh, to the to the improvements of the building and but if they have if someone finds if the assembly finds that one of the elements of the vigilant committee that normally if it's a big complex is uh, formed by five people and two substitutes and uh, if it's a small complex uh, is formed by two five, by two owners remember that in the assembly of uh, owners the only people that can participate in the assembly of the association of owners uh, are owners of the of, of the condominium complex no one can participate unless they're condo owners and that's why when you penetrate and you start to participate 
in the assembly you need to show proof of your title of deed and uh, you, not, you, need, you need to uh, show your ID and then you register yourself and then once you are in the assembly uh, they vote to, to appoint the table that is going to rule uh, the presidency of that assembly normally the assembly has a president, has a secretary and has uh, what they call escrutadores which are the ones that count the votes of the participants so uh, uh, also I want to tell you that there's other reunions that are informal that they, we call them juntas informales, informal uh, uh, reunions that is when suddenly you are in your building and there is a, a problem that happened in the building so uh, the condo owners that are in the complex they need to uh, get together in the lobby or in, a, or in a place in the building and normally you draw uh, a small affidavit uh, to be presented in the future assembly and discuss the problem that happened like maybe perhaps uh, uh, the swimming pool broke or the elevator broke or there was a leak of water or there was a short circuit of electricity something happened that is imperative that someone uh, sees the problem so those are informal reunions only if they are important you need to take note and present that uh, affidavit in, uh, in the assembly so they uh, take note of it. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, in general, uh, there's in the small buildings, in general, in the small buildings, in the let's say units buildings that have only 10 uh, units because normally there is uh, uh, they get informal uh, an informal association and uh, of condo owners and they appoint one of them as an administrator when there are big complexes big condominium complexes normally uh, they appoint an employee an employee uh, that will see as his boss, as his patron, uh, the civil association of condo owners. So I think uh, for the moment this is all. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you, as I told you first, about the differences between the Mexican law and the American law, the Anglo-Saxon law, about the restrictions for foreigners, which probably you already understand that after uh, five interventions uh, we had to put restrictions to the foreign investment that uh, as I told you there was one big war in Mexico that was uh, declared only because one bakery of this French gentleman gen French citizen uh, asked for the protection of his country so that's why we restrict completely the the foreign investment, but that does not mean that you cannot invest in the inside the Republic. Uh, there's restriction for the coast and for the borders, but there is no restrictions for the Republic. There's also restrictions for corporations. In Mexico, foreigners only can uh, own 49% of the shares, and a Mexican company will own 51% uh, of the shares. The best example is uh, Costco or Sam's Club. Uh, Costco got uh, associated with uh, Comercial Mexicana. I understand in 49% and Comercial Mexicana 51, which are, is one of the largest companies in Mexico that has supermarkets. And Sam's Club also got a partnership with Aurora, probably in the same uh, amounts. And uh, in the older days, yes, there was foreigners used to uh, own 100% uh, of the shares but not anymore, not anymore. Today is uh, 49.51 uh, 
and also you have to declare that you will not you will renounce to the protection of your country and you will consider yourself as Mexican for any dispute or any affair that uh, could overcome subsequently uh, in that uh, in that business that you're going to start well for today this is all thank you very much for your company I hope you like this uh, uh, chat that we have in regards to the Mexican law the condominium law and I hope in the future I can give you another talk about different matters that I already written like uh, the hereditary law uh, I have three books which is uh, the history of the notarial law and uh, the the hereditary law which is this and then this is the real estate real estate uh, uh, real estate uh, uh, book and uh, maybe perhaps in the future and can give you another talk about it thank you very much you're very kind and very nice to to tolerate me bye